Club of Portland's Friday Forum. City Club is where civic-minded people come together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live, work, and play. I'm Greg McPherson, president of City Club. Members and guests are gathered today at the Sentinel Hotel, along with all of you listening on OPB radio or watching on Portland Community Media. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners enables us to put on the state's best civic programs week after week. Our media partner is Oregon Business Magazine. Our current Friday Forum sponsors are AARP of Oregon, McKinley Urban, Iberdrola Renewables, Airbnb, and Uber. Please join me in showing our appreciation for all of them. At next week's Friday Forum, we will present part two of a two-part series on housing. The topic will be Portland's housing crisis, creating the future or removing the past. This program will address the tension between infill housing and historic preservation, bringing together a panel of three compelling voices. You can learn more about City Club events, purchase tickets, and become a member on our website, pdxcityclub.org. As always, we will be live tweeting today's program. You can follow along and join the conversation using the hashtag PDXCityClub. Later in today's program, Kurt Krieger will facilitate a Q&A session with those in the live audience. Asking questions at the microphone is a benefit of City Club membership, but anyone in the live audience here at the Sentinel may write a question on one of the index cards found at the center of the tables. Hold the card up and City Club staff will collect them before or during the Q&A session. And now for today's program. This summer, Portland renters saw a rise in no-cause evictions and a dramatic increase in rents. The impacts of these changes can be devastating physically, mentally, and socially, resulting in lost access to transportation, community, neighborhood schools, and basic family stability. More and more people are asking, is affordable housing still attainable in, in Portland? What policy changes or creative solutions are needed to keep Portland affordable? Joining us today is Kurt Krieger, the new director of the Portland Bureau of Housing. He will provide some introductory remarks before moderating our panel, which includes Israel Bayer of Street Roots, Eli Spivak of Orange Splot, and Martha McLennan of Northwest Housing Alternatives. Kurt Krieger was appointed director of the Portland Housing Bureau in August of this year. He is charged with developing citywide housing policy, delivering programs that increase the supply of affordable housing, preventing and ending homelessness, and promoting stable home ownership. Kurt Krieger brings 30 years of experience working in affordable housing and community development, serving most, direct, most recently in director-level positions in Fairfax, Virginia and Vancouver, Washington. He also worked at Arizona State University, leading research, public policy, and demonstration projects to advance sustainable urbanism and affordable housing statewide. Please join me in welcoming our panel and director, Kurt Krieger. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I've been given a few minutes to introduce myself to the audience here at City Club. <clears throat> and then I'll frame sort of where I think we're going at the Housing Bureau before we engage our capable panelists in a conversation about the state of emergency with respect to housing and homelessness here in Portland. Just by way of introduction, my name is Kurt Krieger. I am uh, new to the city of Portland, but well acquainted with the Northwest. I'd like to give a shout out to some of my friends here, the Portland Bureau of Housing table, Commissioner Salzman's table, I see former colleagues at OTAC, Inc., and some members of the Portland Housing Advisory Commission, who is instrumental in advising the Bureau and Commissioner Salzman on policy matters. So <clears throat> what we love about Portland is Portland Opera. We love Northwest Wines. I'm happy to be back in Portland. I've never fully understood the nomenclature of bridges in this town. I've been working in and around Portland for 30 years, and I could never figure out why the Fremont Bridge doesn't connect to Fremont Avenue. Uh, the steel bridge is a steel bridge, but there are several steel bridges. So does that mean the orange steel bridge, the green steel bridge, or the black steel bridge? 
and don't the other bridges have steel in them too? And is there a wood bridge that I'm supposed to know about someplace that I haven't seen lately? So I, I may never figure out the bridge, the bridge nomenclature here, but what attracted me most to accept the challenge that Commissioner Dan Salzman gave to me with respect to the Housing Bureau is really to take the agency to the next level of excellence. <clears throat> Why do I think it's a good time to take such an opportunity? First, I would say that the political will in Portland is strong and cohesive. I've worked in a lot of jurisdictions across the country. I've worked in Los Angeles, I've worked in Phoenix, I've worked in Seattle, I've worked in the D.C. metro area. And I'd say that the political consensus is greater here than any place else I've seen in over 30 years of practice. So it's a moment in time opportunity to get something really transformational accomplished. That doesn't happen very often in politics, and as an administrator or staff person, you can never create political will. All you can do is hope to channel it, and if it doesn't exist, you cannot, as a staff person, create it. Uh, it has to come from within the, the electorate, and it has to come within the elected officials. Secondly, I'd say there's a sense of hope. Things are bad, but things are not hopeless. Things are serious, perhaps even desperate, but we haven't reached a point of no return. And I can say, having worked in other areas like Watts in South Central Los Angeles, like some of the barrios of Phoenix, that there are places where things are a lot worse than here. Our needs are significant, some 24,000 housing units short of current demand with another 10,000 to produce, so we need about 35,000 units of affordable housing, which is a big number, but it's not an insurmountable number. Um, and then last, what I find in Portland is a sense of shared values, values of equity, values of inclusion, and values of sustainability. And for someone that has lived at the intersection of equity and sustainability, being back in Portland is a very good thing indeed. I'm a lifelong houser, been doing this a long time. You might get to know me as the Leonard Cohen of housing. That means to say, you'll always see me wearing a hat. I have a dark, deep, dark, baritone voice. And, um, and I feel like I've arrived at a point in my life where I know what I'm good at. I'm good at producing housing. I stopped counting at 10,000. I haven't bothered to count for the last several years because Frankly, it's like a lot of things in life. If you get obsessed with the numbers, you take your eye off the, what's really important. So I'm an environmental planner by training, but a developer by choice. And the real task in Portland is to take our existing delivery system to the next level. We are producing some 1,350 housing units at the present time through our network of legacy nonprofits and capable private developers. We need to double, if not triple, that level of production to make progress on the unmet need that we see in our community today. So <clears throat> six of the last 10 years, I've been a renter. So can I see a show of hands on how many renters we have in the household here? So 25, maybe 25%, it's great. You know, being a renter means that you have to put yourself into the marketplace. You have to put yourself in the mercy of somebody else that has something that you want. And depending on the nature of that marketplace, it can be a very humbling experience. Now, I'm tall, white, and employed. That gives me certain access which other people don't have. If you have a criminal record, if you're low income, if you're not white, you have a different experience perhaps than I would have. But I think it's worth mentioning that as a renter, you get to know state laws pretty rapidly. In Arizona, where I rented from two entities, including Native American Connections, as a market rate tenant in a low income housing tax credit building operated by the largest Native American Behavioral Health Institute in Phoenix, Arizona, <clears throat> what I learned very quickly is that they charge sales tax on rent in Arizona. Now, that is really a novel concept. Talk about a penalty for the people who have the least power in a society is to charge them 7% sales tax on their monthly rent bill. Of course, the logic, I think, is political, right? They don't vote so much. They're highly mobile. They're not going to notice this small amount of money, but it does add up rather rapidly. The Commonwealth of Virginia exempts landlords from the Landlord-Tenant Act if they have fewer than 10 units. Well, the mom and pop landlords tend to be the least sophisticated landlords and most likely to cause fair housing concerns, most likely to discriminate against people of color. 
So uh, it's, it's an oddity, uh, but it works for the Commonwealth of Virginia. It's a southern state, after all. <clears throat> so for six of the last 10 years, I've been a renter, uh, a renter by choice. It's important to underscore that. Uh, those have been my choices and my choices alone based on where I wanted to live and what I wanted to do with my time. So <clears throat> by, by putting myself in that position, I think I have some empathy for what tenants go through. Let me talk a little bit about the state of housing today, right now, and why the mayor declared a state of emergency with respect to homelessness and housing. Average rents have increased over 30% in five years. Vacancy rates have oscillated between 2.5% and 3.2% for each of the last three years, which is less than half of what is considered to be a healthy residential real estate market of between 5 and 7%. Low-wage workers saw a 5.4% decrease in inflation-adjusted salaries between 2009 and 2014. So your income's going down, your rent's going up. This is a problem for pretty much anybody. But those numbers are staggering. We have <clears throat> what I would call virulent, persistent, and intractable homelessness in Portland. 30% of the folks counted in the last point in time were women, up 16%. 4% were children. And 59% were people with disabilities. Some 4,311 people accessed publicly funded shelters between July 2014 and June 2015. That's 3,500 individuals. An additional 1,887 were unsheltered at the point in time count last January. So we have a persistent problem. And as was discussed this week at City Council, we need to be mindful that we've housed thousands of people in the meantime producing more affordable housing and more shelter beds, it would have been a lot worse had we not done so. But the numbers are not moving sufficiently to satisfy anyone. One good indicator of this, and I see Michael Bonacore in the audience for Home Forward, the Housing Authority serving Portland and Multnomah County processes about $70 million worth of rental assistance vouchers, something called housing choice vouchers. Some old school folks might call them Section 8. It's now called Housing Choice. It's meant to give tenants choice in the marketplace by subsidizing their rents, so they pay no more than 30% of their income for rent and utilities. So people wait years to get these things, right? And only 20 to 25% of the people who are eligible actually receive a voucher, and then they have about 90 days to find a landlord to take that voucher. <clears throat> if they don't find a landlord to take the voucher, they have to give it back and it's given to the next person on the waiting list. Well, the turn back rate in 2011 was 8%, so some 91%, a little over 91% of the people were finding successful placements. They were finding rents at rents they could afford under the HUD-defined fair market rent. <clears throat> at present, 25% of the people are turning those vouchers back. And if you look at the East Bay, Contra Costa, California, Santa Clara, California, fewer than half of the households are actually finding places to rent with a voucher that they've waited five to seven years to receive. So the turn back rate is a indicator of need and it is a serious matter indeed. <clears throat> I wanna, before I start asking questions of our colleagues, I'm going to ask the first question from up here. I'm going to migrate to the microphone at the chair. Uh, so it's more conversational in nature, but I do want to make sure that anyone that uses an acronym to please explain what the acronym is first before you use the term so that we don't confuse the audience here in the room or at home. <clears throat> and I would frame the issue by saying that in the last 10 days, the city council, the mayor, the chair of the board of commissioners, of county commissioners have announced about $90 million of funding for housing and homelessness. That's a huge effort, uh, and it comes at a particularly important time. But the declaration of a state of emergency also carries with it some policy moves, some regulatory relief, because state law allows the mayor and the, to waive certain regulatory requirements. Also the governor, should she choose to declare a state of emergency. So I would ask our panelists, <clears throat> uh, 
and I'm saying it now so that they start to think about this because I've not given them these questions ahead of time. Uh, I would ask them to be thinking about what regulations they would waive if they were given, you know, three to five to suggest. So as they think about that, I'm going to introduce our panelists. For the last 10 years, Israel Baer has served as executive director of Street Roots, leading advocacy efforts related to homelessness and housing. Street Roots participates in advocacy efforts to support people experiencing poverty with an emphasis on local and state budget priorities, mental health issues, public safety, housing, and civil rights. After serving as a, <clears throat> he's being joined by Eli Spivak, <clears throat> and Eli served on the boards of uh, Proud Ground and Dignity Village after having worked as a construction supervisor for Habitat for Humanity. He then launched his own development company and is a general contractor. His company is called Orange Splot LLC. He pioneers new models of community-oriented housing, including the creation of smaller, more affordable homes in Portland, including accessory dwelling units. <clears throat> We're also joined by Martha McLennan, and since 2002, Martha has been executive director of Northwest Housing Alternatives, the largest nonprofit housing provider in the state of Oregon. Northwest Housing Alternatives also works to end homelessness in Clackamas County via emergency shelter, transitional housing, and eviction prevention services. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is ask Martha to respond to her three to five favorite regulatory relief measures, uh, followed by Eli and then Israel, and I'll take a seat. Thank you. I think the thing I would start with is the process for getting through the development review process with the city and the need for that to be more predictable uh, and timely. Right now, that process can add six months, nine months to the development cycle, during which time you're incurring costs. So those are costs that are a little bit unnecessary. One of the things to consider is whether affordable housing should have some kind of ombudsman or gatekeeper that can help you navigate that process. I know we had a rehabilitation project a few years ago that had gone all the way through the process and we were ready to break ground and then somebody got worried about street trees and that delayed the construction start for almost three months. So that kind of thing could be expedited, that could be um, a way to help move this process along. I'll talk also just a little bit about design review. Um, right now, uh, as an affordable housing developer, one of the things that we strive to do is to be welcomed into the community. Um, and that may make us be a little bit um, more sensitive about design review in terms of designing things at the front end that we think will be more welcome. If we had more confidence that we could successfully navigate the design review process, if we were more confident that we would have the support throughout that um, entitlement process, maybe we could simplify the designs a little bit. I don't want to create properties that aren't fit, don't fit into the neighborhood, that aren't good places to live, but there is a way that we may tart the projects up a little bit more than they need to be, and that adds uh, construction costs that might be able to be avoided. So if we could have more predictability about what would be acceptable, we could design that at the beginning. We would, again, remove some of that uncertainty, have a more crisp conversation with the neighbors, um, and move the projects forward uh, a little bit less expensively. That's a great question, and I'm excited that um, the Housing Bureau is interested in those issues because for all the importance of affordable housing subsidy, it's still kind of winning a golden ticket to get an affordable housing unit, um, and we need the market sector to step up. So I think the best things we can do are to re-legalize traditional market-based forms of affordable housing. And we can look back, I'm a reluctant historian here, World War II was the last time we had a huge housing crunch in Portland in the war industry. There were things like courtyard apartments, 
there were things like, even in the single family zones, homes could be divided into duplexes. That was before we created R5 zoning and swept most of the city with um, single dwelling zones. And people had boarding houses. Many of those things are illegal today. Um, and some of the housing types neighbors most appreciate are the ones from those older neighborhoods. And if you look at the zoning maps, a lot of times they're illegal to build today. So one of the lowest hanging fruits we can go for it is to create a context and the zoning code is where to do it, where we can have legal access to housing types that people already love and they're smaller units which we need more of and it provides an alternative to some of the really large homes going up right now and something in between scale, those homes in the four plus story apartments you see in neighborhoods. So that's one approach we can take from a regulatory side. The other is, let's, it, it's terrible that we have a situation where the least expensive affordable housing unit you can build is 100,000 plus and the next step down that you can legally live in is a tent. That's a huge range there. And we need to come up with market-based options that are legal to live in between. So tiny homes are one idea for that. Um, Eugene just passed a, an ordinance that allows um, permanent overnight sleeping so you can legally live by permission, regulated in someone's backyard or a church can have a parking lot. So you can just create some middle area so people don't have to live in a tent, you know, um, and there's something that they can legally sleep in on private property. There's a lot Portland can do in the state of emergency to provide that option too. Um, so I, I would say more from a layman's perspective that there really needs to be a three-tiered strategy based around regulation, incentives, and uh, revenue. And it's really important that we have a menu of options. There's no one single size that fits all when we're talking about the housing crisis. You know, a little historical context is we're already starting from a deficit. Uh, we've lost billions of dollars from the federal government over the last 30 years. We've had an enormous amount of tools that other states use to support affordable housing and homelessness um, that are preempted at the state level, uh, things like real estate transfer tax, inclusionary zoning, rent control, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we're already starting with, um, we, we only have minimal options to be able to move forward and we need a whole array of different uh, tools to be able to use into the future. I would say that, you know, all, you, without getting into the weeds, ultimately what we need is uh, bold action uh, from, our, from our elected leaders. We need bold action from our community. Uh, this, these issues have been something that we've been talking about for the past 30 years. Um, I think because of the collective anxiety in our community, where the market's at, understanding that we have thousands of people sleeping on our streets that, that don't ever seem to go away. Um, it's rising to the level where uh, electeds are, um, that, that, that may care or all of a sudden having to pay attention, not because uh, of a simple moral question, but because uh, it could be the first time that housing actually affects uh, elections. And so, um, things are gonna start moving and we want them to move. And so we need a whole array of, of things to be able to do that, um, to be able to get the ball moving. Thank you very much. <clears throat> For those of you just joining into OPB, I'm Kurt Krieger here at the City Club Friday Forum discussing the housing crisis in Portland. With me are Street Roots Israel Bayer, who just spoke, Eli Spivak of Orange Splot LLC and Northwest Housing Alternatives, Martha McLennan. I'd like to turn to a separate subject, <clears throat> and that has to do with income, income, income disparities and wage stagnation, um, because some folks would see this as an income problem, not necessarily a housing problem. Uh, there's housing out there, you just need to make more money to occupy it. Uh, according to the Pew Research Center in spring of this year, 30% of America's workforce these are people working, not disabled. 30% of America's workforce earns near the minimum, minimum wage, nearly 21 million people. <clears throat> In this community, some $17 to $20 an hour is needed to rent an average two-bedroom apartment. And according to our research, that is rapidly diminishing. Uh, we released to council yesterday the state of housing in Portland. It's online. We'd be happy to respond to questions you might have. But 
<clears throat> even as we were preparing the report, the velocity of rent increases was accelerating as the report was being published, causing some neighborhoods that had been affordable this spring to fall out of affordability. <clears throat> of course, Oregon's legislature has debated increasing the minimum wage and it hasn't changed yet. Uh, further, if you look at the number of hours you have to work at a minimum wage job to afford an average two-bedroom apartment, in Oregon we're actually somewhat fortunate. You only have to work 58 hours a week. In Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, some 97 hours, which is actually more than California, which is 92 hours on average. In Washington State, 73 hours. So <clears throat> two incomes may not be enough. Uh, three incomes may not be enough. So <clears throat> I would start this discussion with Israel because I think he's closer to the, ec the economic sort of heartbeat of the street and ask what needs to happen with respect to incomes and income disparity. Um, well, you know, we're hitting a point, um, obviously I think Street Roots is very much for a $15 minimum wage. I think that without a, a, a healthy minimum wage in our community that we're going to start seeing um, industries and, and groups of people uh, displaced from our community and, and people that are already being displaced. But it, here's the thing, the nonprofit industry, as an example, um, we're starting to see nonprofit workers being displaced that are helping homeless people that are being displaced, and that's real. And um, the retail industry. Uh, so this is not just a question about homelessness. This is a question about our entire community, lifting our entire community up to be able uh, to equalize opportunities for people to be successful. Uh, you can't um, begin to think about tackling the, the housing uh, problem without tackling the wage problem. So I just think that, you know, when you look at our neighbors in uh, Seattle and San Francisco, I believe San Francisco just uh, this month uh, released a report where they have a teacher shortage because people don't uh, have the ability to live in the city. Um, we always believe that the high water mark is now, but if we look at our other communities, that high water mark just keeps getting higher and higher and higher. And if we don't act boldly now, um, we will be facing uh, those very circumstances in the near future. I don't work as directly with economic development issues. I'm a general contractor, so I get to swing a hammer once in a while. But here's what scares me, and maybe as a motivator for the affordable housing side. I mean, Portland's the ninth most expensive city in the country. If we take, and we have more expensive cities to the north and south of us who know that Portland's cheap by comparison to them, if we move from ninth position to the equivalent of eighth position, which is Boston level average housing costs, that's about a $70,000 per unit bump up. If we don't have incomes climb along with housing costs, that means it's going to cost $70,000 more per unit to subsidize housing than we're spending today. So if we don't have incomes climbing with our housing costs, and we, there's some things we could do to decrease how much our housing costs rise, um, then the amount of subsidy we're going to need to make housing affordable to just the people we have today is going to skyrocket. So that's a good reason for us to try and increase the minimum wage and take other measures to um, make sure that incomes rise as housing prices do too. Uh, certainly incomes are, are a piece of the picture. Uh, sometimes we have this conversation of it's just an economic development problem or it's just a housing problem. It's actually both and something that we need to focus on both sides of. My agency this year adopted a $15 minimum wage for our staff. Um, we only had a few staff that were at a lower income than that, but um, set that as a new standard and we offer full health insurance for employees who work half time or more. So again, two things to kind of make sure that our own staff are not on the brink of um, this instability. But it's also important to look at some of the other folks in our community and what their incomes are and what that means. The average income for somebody with social security disability income is only $775 a month. The average social security for a senior that's being collected is under $1,300 a month. I looked this morning on Craigslist a little bit to see what rents were right now. And the um, average of the, the top 10 one-bedroom apartments that I found this morning was um, 
$1,022 a month. Um, and there were only two of those 10 that were actually under 1,000. So when we have folks with disabilities, when we have folks with, who are seniors, um, the ability to raise those incomes is a bigger challenge, is a challenge at the federal level, and one that has not been addressed in a way that keeps pace with uh, inflation. <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit more now about production. Of, I mentioned that we have about 1,350 units in our current development pipeline. These include extremely low-income units financed with tax increment and with federal funds, uh, as well as low-income housing under 80 percent of median income, and increasingly some properties that are of a mixed income nature where you might mix marker rate units with below marker rate units. <clears throat> and if we were to triple production, Obviously, it would require more resources, but it would also require perhaps a different way of doing business. Uh, and I think it's worth calling that question. Uh, what would the role of private developers be to help satisfy that need? What would the role of neighborhoods and neighborhood associations be to satisfy that? And what would the role of community development corporations be in that effort? And then last, as individuals, as citizens, what's our, our our social obligation. Martha? So as a nonprofit developer of affordable housing, um, and I see quite a number of folks in the room who also come from that industry, I know that we have the brain power uh, and the capacity to triple our production if we had subsidies. Right now, we go through very arduous application processes, and um, typically one out of three projects gets financed in the first round, then we might repeat that process and go along. So we have that capacity. We could build more if there were more resource. Some of the things that are getting in the way of that are the complex financing structures and the timelines to take a de deal from concept to completion. Typically, it takes an affordable housing project three to five years from the time you secure land to the time that you first rent the unit. That's because I'm assembling financing through a combination of city resources, state resources, federal resources, private resources, all of those um, having different timelines, all of those having different uh, objectives, all of those having different ways that those partners are hedging their risk. So one of the pieces is to think about how to simplify that affordable housing finance system, make the applications um, Contiguous, apply once and get all the financing packages together would be one simple idea about how to do that. One thing neighborhoods and developers can team up on is to find creative ways to allow additional people to live in our city um, and to provide places where developers can build more smaller units, which means incentives for building, for example, more homes so long as they're under a certain square footage. Um, and to avoid situations where you have, like Los Angeles, where you think there'd be lots of space to build homes, but through the fiefdom of local neighborhood associations, they've capped density at very low levels. Um, I think there are lots of opportunities in Portland to allow row houses, cottage, cottage clusters, um, bungalow courts, duplexes, tries, quads, that there's a huge market for them. They're small homes. We have smaller households, as people might have noticed. And it's perfect for the millennials and for the downsizing empty nesters. Allow that product type to flourish in Portland would be a great thing we can do. Um, I'll speak more from the community side. I, you know, I, Street Roots is a big advocate of density, and we believe that as long as um, people are sleeping on our streets, we shouldn't. Uh, we should be building to the sky. Um, we don't think that the idea uh, of of preserving a community. Um, we don't want to preserve a community where people continue to sleep on our streets. And so um, I will also say, you know, in the context of, of putting political pressure on the powers that be in our community um, that will be able to take on very heavy and serious and powerful industries 
that should be at this table uh, providing solutions will require our community uh, to collectively raise their voice up and demand that there be action. And I think you're seeing that happening, um, but I, I, I wanna say that uh, it's critical uh, for not just people in the Portland region, but people around the state to collectively raise their voice up right now and say that housing matters. Uh, we know uh, through the Welcome Home Coalition, which is a coalition of 105 organizations region, region wide, uh, that we need uh, at least $50 million annually additionally to the money that we're already investing to be able to begin to chip away at this. So we need a long-term permanent solution uh, of revenue for housing. Without that, we cannot tackle this problem, and, and now is our time, and, and it's our time uh, to go big. <clears throat> I'd like to remind, for those of you just tuning in to OPB, that I'm Kurt Krieger here at the City Club during our Friday forum discussing the housing crisis in Portland. Joining with me is Israel Bayer of Street Roots, Eli Spivak of Orange Splot LLC, and Northwest Housing Alternatives, Martha McLennan. I'd like to talk a little bit now about authenticity. One of the things that attracted me to Portland, having lived in other places, including Seattle, is Portland's different. It has a different feel. And it can be explained maybe in a lot of different ways. San Francisco had an earthquake, Seattle had a fire. There's nothing older in either one of those two cities that predates the fire or the earthquake. And Portland didn't have either. So we've got a lot of old buildings that didn't have to survive such trauma. But the neighborhoods are also different. Uh, there's a quote that I really like from Ada Louise Huxtable, who at the time was the architecture critic for the New York Times. And she made it in reference to Seattle, but I think it could apply to Portland. She said, it's such a lovely city, I wonder why they're tearing it down. <clears throat> you look around Portland, you see cranes everywhere. You see cranes on the central east side. Throughout the Pearl, we've got a thicket of cranes. I tried to get up to the Abigail at the fields, and uh, about every street was blocked off. And I'm not quite sure how people get around town these days. It's difficult, and things are changing. But it's also changing in the neighborhoods. We're seeing the infill occurring on small lots. We're seeing lot splits. We're seeing accessory dwelling units at a great rate, some over 300 this year alone. I do in part because of a city policy to waive system development charges. <clears throat> and yet there's concern about losing the character of neighborhoods, losing the authenticity of Portland. And I think in part the demolition tax that's been proposed by Mayor Hales tries to capture that value tries to direct that value to a public good. But I'd like people to reflect a little bit about how we can grow with grace, how we can keep our authentic Portland character without just becoming another, another city on the West Coast in uh, a seismic Pacific subduction zone prone to earthquakes. How do we keep what's special about Portland? How do we keep what we came here for intact? Martha? Uh, I'm born and raised in Portland, third generation, um, so and have an incredible fondness for this community. I think in large part the authenticity comes from the sense of community, and I think we can increase the density and still have that sense of community. It is about sensitive design and development. I think one of the dynamics that we have right now that feels so shocking is that we had a period of time during the recession where nothing was built. And then all of a sudden, we have this um, wave of these three and four story buildings. We kind of missed the thing in between, which is that process, that natural process that cities go through of doubling their density over a few decades. So I think while we're feeling that shock right now, in the long term, I think this development process is not going to change the character of the community. We still will have that sense of neighborliness. We still will have that sense of um, connection to our commercial districts, to our schools, to other um, aspects of the community that give us the strength that we have in Portland. One of the things that I noted was that um, in the school, homeless school count came out today. And statewide, we have almost 16,000 children who are doubled up in the housing. Again, in my look on Craigslist this morning, I saw a two-bedroom apartment 
that was notable to me because it was advertised as Sleeping Seven. Now I can think about four in a two bedroom, maybe five in a two bedroom, but seven in a two bedroom is different. So part of the risk we have by saying we want the physical structures to look the same, but the density is increasing, is that we're creating some of the negative impacts that we're fearful of by increasing the density. Seven people in a two bedroom apartment is creating a parking issue, is creating a transportation issue, is creating a school issue. If, if that was in a accessory dwelling units, if that was in converting things into duplexes, if that was providing a little bit more density on corners um, or closer to the arterials, I think um, that would be a better way to accomplish what we need to do. I think the best thing we can do to save our beautiful older homes in our great neighborhoods is to give them some more economic value in some other way. So one example is we have, I know of exact example of an 11 bedroom home in North Portland with one person living in it. You could have 11 people living in that, except you'd violate our household definition law on the books in Oregon. There are examples of homes that are, um, they could easily be divided into two units and that would give it more economic develop, more economic value, and therefore less likely to be scraped. There's some laws on the books. If it's a landmark historic building, that you can actually do internal divisions, but that only applies to a handful of structures in, in our city. That could be expanded to older homes in general. But I think we all should be aware of the immaculate conception model of, of development. I mean, those bungalows we love right now were oftentimes fought when they were built because they were replacing older homes. So the idea that that never happens is a product of the moment. And it's easy to be alert to think that this never happened before. Well, those very homes that people are trying to protect right now um, were, were oftentimes fought when they were built. Because the development's a messy business. It made money for people 90 years ago, just like it makes money for people today. So it's really good to have that perspective, I think. Um, you know, I, I would just say I, I, we're all for uh, preserving authentic neighborhoods, but 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 there's there's no use in having preserving a neighborhood when you have tens of thousands of people of color being displaced from those neighborhoods and poor and working class people that can't afford to live in those neighborhoods. And so, times are changing. Portland is changing. We have to accept that, and we have to be smart and sophisticated and strategic about how we build out our neighborhoods in a way that requires affordable housing and requires people uh, to be able to live in those neighborhoods because simply uh, you can't have a great neighborhood when you don't have uh, a diversity of people living in that neighborhood. So this is a good time to start to segue to audience questions. And I'm going to, to remind folks that they're listening to City Club Fridays, a forum discussing the housing crisis in Portland with Israel Bayer of Street Roots, Eli Spivak of Orange Splot LLC and Northwest Housing Alternatives, Martha McLennan. <clears throat> we have a question and answer portion of the program. If you have a question on our index card, please hold it up so city staff can collect it from you and they'll present it to me. And we'll also consider questions from the audience. As always, we invite members to the microphone to ask their question. Asking questions at the Friday Forum, microphone is a benefit of City Club membership, and membership is open to everyone. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. Also, I'll be reading at least one index card question. Thanks very much. We have a question here. Hi, my name is Christina Branham, and I'm a Civic Associate with the City Club of Portland. One thing I have not heard mentioned today is the state of the no-cause evictions that are happening in mass. As I'm sure all of you know, the Community Alliance of Tenants has asked for a one-year moratorium on no-cause evictions. Um, I'm sure you know that families are finding themselves with as little as 30 days to find a new home in a very, very tight rental market. So is a moratorium like this realistic? And if not, what other measures can we take to protect tenants from displacement? Um, absolutely. The, uh, the rental market right now is very tight. We talked about um, it floating it around that 2% to 3% level. At 2%, that means that somebody is already standing in line ready for that unit 
and the vacancy is simply the amount of time it takes to clean the carpets, wash out the refrigerator, maybe put some new paint up. It's a very low vacancy rate. People are really struggling with that. Having a longer length of time to find replacement housing is critical. The other thing I think that's really important to do is to think about what we can do to help those people who are most vulnerable with eviction prevention and rapid rehousing services. You know, we see clients all the time who come in and say, I sprained my ankle, I couldn't work for six weeks, I lost my job, I didn't pay the rent for two months, and now I'm being evicted. I can step in, provide a couple months of rent assistance, they're ready to be back to work, and they're stable, and they don't create that whole cycle of homelessness, which is incredibly costly for us as a community and costly for that individual family. Um, same story. The car had a flat tire. I went to Les Schwab. They said I need two, actually four, car, four tires. I need the car to get to the job. I got back on the rent. Again, a few hundred, a few thousand dollars can stabilize those families, and that's really important. We need to invest more in those kinds of programs. Yeah, I, I believe uh, Commissioner, uh, the Housing Commissioner Dan Saltzman is looking at moving the moratorium from 30 days to 90 days. Uh, of course, we would love to see that to be at one year. Uh, we're really expecting our state legislatures to go down uh, both in the short session and the session next year and have a really strong showing on housing because without partners at a local and state level, we can't push these things through. So uh, I think the ball's moving, yes, on a moratorium for evictions. Um, uh, so yes. If you want to look ahead for a second, um, it's going to be in the headlines for sure when 150 apartments get flipped to condos. I believe that's going to be coming back pretty soon. So the best time to pass the legislation is when it's not happening. This will be a good time to protect people who are in buildings that are in version of um, condo conversion process, which I do not think is preempted by state law. And just to finish that conversation, um, the, the ordinance crafting this extension will be on the city council docket. I think if you have an interest in it, the Commissioner Salzman office would be happy to to give you a sort of a brief on it of <clears throat> state law is helpful in that it suggests that there be a minimum of 30 days notice for people with tenancies less than one year and a minimum 60 days notice for people with tenancies over one year which suggests that those be minimums. Um, we do expect it to be if not contested litigated and the longer such a notice is given the more grounds there would likely be for litigation. So I think the compromise is a 90-day compromise, um, but there will be a hearing on it, and people that are interested in uh, expressing their views will have every opportunity to do so at the City Council. I have a question on a card that I'm going to ask. How is the City addressing the impact of Airbnb on our housing crisis? Does the housing state of emergency warrant greater vigilance and enforcement on the restriction of short-term rentals? And will a city level threaten fines against Airbnb? <clears throat> and I, what I can tell you is what I heard stated Wednesday is that the mayor has joined Commissioner Salzman and Commissioner Fish as the third vote to allocate the already appropriated Airbnb revenue to help provide more housing, which is news. It's news as of Wednesday. Um, <clears throat> That's a, currently a million dollars a year, and should it be perhaps a growing market, it could be more uh, in due time. Any other comments here from folks about Airbnb? And I know that it's been published in the, the local press about sort of whether or not it's being abused or not. You know, we've talked mostly about Portland today, but um, in, across Oregon, affordable housing is a problem. Um, there's probably a 100,000 unit shortage. And in tourist communities, the Airbnb problem is really, it's really exacerbating that in those communities where um, places that had been occupied by folks who worked in those communities, lived in those communities, and are now part of the vacation rental business um, are making that shortage even worse. Any other comments on that subject? Or shall we go to another? Good. Uh, I would like to suggest, and this will 
be discussed at city council but with a reliable revenue stream of a million dollars a year should the city council like to bond against that revenue stream you could sell a ten million dollar bond backed by the dedicated revenues of airbnb it would require you to dedicate those revenues for the term of the bond <clears throat> portland could be the first city in north america to provide bond financing in that manner and uh, I think it's worth exploring, frankly, given our emergency. Hello? Cameron, Witt. <laughs> Cameron Witten, City Club member. Uh, this might actually be a question that's better for elected officials, but I'm curious, at what point do you believe that elected officials should declare that the housing state of emergency is over? Uh, what would the demographics of our community look like where we would say that we don't have to waive zoning regulations and increase funding? Well, that's a good point. Uh, we've been asked to provide the documentation to the office of the city attorney who has to defend the city's action in this regard. Uh, <clears throat> we obviously need to see movement in the current problems. I mentioned some of the metrics to you earlier. Uh, we think the state of emergency could, could, could last a year, uh, and that year will require very diligent efforts through the year to make progress on the current backlog to demonstrate that we're providing resources to cure the problem, not just declaring a state of emergency and sitting on our hands. I think anything longer than a year would be very difficult to justify. Uh, but if we start to waive development regulations, it needs to be a sufficiently long period of time that developers can respond to the new world order, the change in regulation or the change in policy. So <clears throat> you don't want to rewrite the code for a very short period of time, 30, 60 days, uh, you really need to have it in place for a sufficiently long period of time. One other thing I'd like to mention here, which I think is, is maybe provocative, and I think I'd like to hear the panel respond to this. You know, somebody asked me, uh, Emergency Services Director Carmen Merlo for the city, uh, she informed me that I'm responsible for all the housing displacement when an earthquake hits. And it occurred to me that that state law does provide for rent control, and state law provides for rent control in the case of a natural disaster. And my father's firm, an architecture firm, in 1962 went to Anchorage, which was the last really big earthquake on the West Coast. And were we to lose 20 or 30 percent of our housing stock tomorrow, we would have a, an emergency. We would need to put into place new policies. So what I would suggest is that we probably need to go through rulemaking and policy and program development now, because unless you can tell me when the earthquake will be, then I won't know for sure when I need the policy in place. So what would a reasonable policy look like to have on the shelf, ready to go, which could be enacted by the mayor by, by a single action, instead of waiting six, eight, nine weeks to put something together? So uh, the, the housing emergency, to my understanding, was declared to be able, with a specific goal, to cut uh, people experiencing homelessness on the streets in half uh, over two years through the Home for Everyone committee that serves as the governing body to be able to tackle this problem. So that's one way to measure uh, the emergency. Uh, you know, I'll also say that it, it's all perspective, right? Uh, Fifty-five people died on the streets last year. Um, uh, and, and that's pretty routine. So in, in the context of uh, uh, the business community, uh, housing advocates, and then actually people experiencing homelessness, uh, obviously it's always an emergency, but I think that one of the metrics that we can really look at uh, that we have to be able to fund is the Home for Everyone Committee, uh, and we're gonna hold government to that, so. We've had a housing emergency for a long time. I, mean, I think that this is a opportunity, it's a political moment we have to form an alliance we need to have in Portland at a relatively young stage for our city, I and mean, we're growing up as a city, um, and the alliance needs to be between the development community to support dedicated resources for affordable housing, and the affordable housing community to support more homes to get built. And other cities that have figured out they need that alliance are Seattle, San Francisco, they're already way more expensive than we are. So this provides a moment for us to take that action when housing prices are not as high as they're likely to grow. I guess I would add one thing, which is that um, we've 
there are a variety of regulatory waivers or adjustments, process adjustments that we've talked about. Um, my hope is that this period, maybe a year, would be a time where we could test these and determine which of them actually um, were dire threats to our community and which ones actually weren't. Um, the notion that um, some of these things might be per sustained after the emergency is over because we discover that they actually do help us create more affordable housing and they do not create um, the scourge in the neighborhoods that we're fearful of. We have a long road in terms of the amount of housing that we need to develop. Um, we're not going to get it done in a year. So we're going to a lightning round right now because we have about four or five minutes left. And as a courtesy to the members standing at the microphone, would you please ask your question to a specific person and one person will respond and we might be able to get a couple of questions in. Please. Hi, my name is Sharon Joy. I am a City Club member and I'm addressing you uh, because I have thought about this problem. I got to answer almost all of them. Uh, and I am representing the disabled community, of course, who hasn't got access to a whole lot of even um, apartments that do exist. Um, I have been working on my own, and I'd like to know how to key in with you and anybody else that would like these ideas that I've been sitting on for at least 30 years. Um, Will, where do I go to, uh, where is the best place to go to start talking with the community of people on this? Israel? Uh, from a government body, I would say the Home for Everyone Committee. Um, from uh, an advocacy committee or uh, an advocacy perspective, uh, look up the Welcome Home Coalition, welcomehome.org, uh, and uh, also CAT. So, uh, those are the main bodies that are really looking to drive things. There's also what's called the Anti-Displacement Coalition that's happening. Um, I'm sure that there are others, but uh, there are three or four groups out there that are driving this conversation, and there's ways for you to get involved. The Housing Bureau also prepares the annual fair housing plan for Multnomah County, and we're in the midst of doing that now. So anything that you have that has to do with disability access, we'd be happy to integrate that into our fair housing planning efforts. Next question. Uh, Kurt Wavering, member. Um, what would it take to require that market rate housing developers include a percentage of their housing as affordable? So right now the state law has a, uh, a preemption on what's called inclusionary zoning, and that's exactly what that does it would say that if a developer comes and wants to build 100 units, they might be required to have 10 of them or 20 of them be affordable. That's a strategy that's used broadly across the country. There are only two states in which there is a preemption, and Oregon is one of them. Uh, it has been uh, uh, an issue that housing advocates have worked on for many years in the legislature and just haven't um, quite made it to that um, to, the, to a, a piece of legislation that would enable local governments to have that choice when they're working with the, the development community. Israel was going to jump in, I thought, but... Uh, I was just gonna say Texas is the other one, so... so um. in, the company of, in the company of Texas. So we have about two minutes remaining. Uh, I'd like to ask a quick lightning round for people. Uh, favorite housing movie? or film, Joe's apartment. Joe's apartment chronicles the life of a person living in New York City looking for affordable housing. Any other thoughts, Israel, Eli, Martha? Any films or movies about housing? Books, any favorite reading? My favorite book is The Big Orange Splot by Daniel Pinkwater, <laughs> which I highly recommend to grown-ups and four-year-olds alike. Israel, you're a publisher. Uh, read your street roots. <laughs> Great. Well, I think that's a good ending note. Thank you very much to our panelists. And thank you much to City Club for hosting us and OPB for distributing the message. Uh, th this is Greg McPherson, president of City Club. Please join me in thanking housing director Kurt Krieger and our other panelists. 
and also the producer of this event from our program committee, Bobby Regan. We're adjourned.